All right, all right, all right. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Imona, Imona Yisrael. And I am making my way slowly back into the YouTube universe, you guys. It's a lot, but I wanted to do some mic check before I actually get started. I've heard you. I've heard you. It's been a while, but I'm back. Um, we want to talk today about divorce. Your fault, divorce, no fault, divorce. And this conversation, some of the topics that I want to address is um, a lot of misinformation, really, that is floating around. But as I'm talking, I'm trying to check on my phone to see whether or not the sound is good before I get started. So if you seems like I'm busy, that's what's going on. Let me know if you guys can hear me. You could put something in the chat to let me know that you can hear me. And what I'm going to be doing is going over some. Uh, OK. LF. What's going on, Blessed Rising? What, what I'm gonna be doing is playing a little video and doing a little noteworthy commentary because I think people are, the sound is good, the sound is good. Okay, tell me if you can hear this video. What happened in September last year? He was very drunk and he um, pushed me around. And this is a divorce court. It's the end of the line for 900,000 Americans a year. I'm trying, to see what, I'm trying to see whether or not the sound is good. All right. So we see the image and the sound is good. We are ready. We read to go. We read to go. We read to go. <laughs> so what I'm essentially going to be doing, all right, but what I'm essentially going to be doing and have been doing is something that I've done in times past. And um, which is systematically approach an issue or subject matter um, with a little more precision. What I see right now in a lot of the YouTube spaces is that a topic that's triggering comes up, right? And people have already been predisposed to the differences, the indifferences, their biases on the subject matter. And then they just begin to argue and it's exciting. So we're watching and we're like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And then at the end of the day, nothing not, is either that nothing is learned. No steps have been taken from what I have observed. I'm like, oh, what in the world is going on here? And so say we deal with a topic or a stat that has been going around concerning divorce. What, what is also happening is when we were young, we were young, we were children. And we look at our parent situation or our grandparent situation, and we write this type of revisionist history. We write this revisionist history about what it was and how it was all good, and this never happened, and that never happened. And in our minds and the mind of a child, we think that. But a lot of the adult type activity may have been shielded from us. And if we don't go back honestly as adults and hear what the adults were saying at that time, we're doing ourselves a disservice and we're doing their memory a disservice because we're setting expectations for society that even they didn't meet at that space and time. So that's the purpose of this. There's a statistic going around, 80% of divorces are initiated by women and it's oftentimes never put into context and it's used to blame one party or the other, right? For whatever they feel is going on. So this video here is um, some divorce court footage from the 60s, okay? 60s when it was cool to be a housewife, when, when you know, Leave it to Beaver is on and I Dream of Jeannie and all of this media, mass media that's pushing this thought process. Let's listen to what they're saying and break it down little by little, shall we? What happened in September last year? He was very drunk and he, um pushed me around and this is a divorce court it's the end of the line for 900,000 Americans a year right. a line that begins in courtship and ends in the courthouse for every four marriage services performed in the United States there is one divorce decree granted so wait a minute one in four he's saying um, ends in divorce at this at this time and she, who may be the one who initiated the divorce, which would be the woman in this case, is saying, hold on, y'all know this is noteworthy and I'm over here trying to check my sound. Hold on, let me get my notebook. <laughs> hold on, can we all write this down? My 
apologies. Doing a lot, juggling and doing a lot. Okay, so essentially, we'll just write a little of this down here. One in four, according to the narrator in the 60s, ends in divorce. They asked her what happened, because at this time you had to have a reason. And she says, let me make sure I can still be heard. And she says, he came, he was drunk, right, alcohol. So we're talking about domestic violence, abuse, and he was pushing her around, right? We know this country had a big problem with that back in the late 80s, early 1900s, because they had a whole temperance movement. Yeah, we still got. So they had a whole temperance movement that dealt with that, but we'll come back and talk about that at another time. Let's continue. He came by the house and he took two of our children and uh, left with them. What did he say to you about He them? said that he would never bring the children back. And I didn't see them or know where they were for one month. So I'm trying to figure out when people are on the internet say, let's go back to the times when, let's go back. I'm trying to figure out what time, you know, what time period you do you want to teleport to? You want to do the Michael J. Fox too. So that when you tell us the time period, we could go back and look at what was actually happened. Greetings and welcomes for those who just joined us. We're taking a look at the truth of divorce in the mid 1900s, you know, just, just for a starting point. And then some people be like, Mona, he didn't say 1960. He said 1932 or whatever time they say, just let us know. And we'll just teleport back to that time to see whether or not they're leaving out any important information. No one will deny that these figures are deeply disturbing. In this broadcast, we shall explore why there is so much divorce in the United States. That's what I'm trying to say, old time, Mr. Broadcaster. Why? In all you get and get understanding, why is there so much divorce? But according to them, people were staying together and there was none of what you're seeing now. I think it, the problem has been exasperated. But to say it didn't exist, man, that's disingenuous. But let's continue. We are trying to figure out why too. Who suffers most and what might be done to help those whose marriages are in trouble? Why is there so much divorce? Remember, this is noteworthy, so I'm taking note. Who suffers most? Today, the issue is um, the man suffers most because the laws have changed and they, uh, they are behind the woman. And so when he divorces, he loses most of his money. And at this time, he's asking who suffers most, right? So people would argue today it's the man, others would say it's the woman. We should report on the confusion created by our having as many divorce laws as there are states in the union. We shall see the lengths to which people go to get around the law, faking evidence, telling lies, mm. traveling thousands of miles to buy their way out of marriages. What? We shall show how people hurt those they should protect most, the children. There's sharp disagreement among experts as to what ought to be done about our divorce dilemma. Lawyers and judges do agree that there's a great deal wrong with the values we bring to divorce and to marriage, American style. The law of divorce ought to begin at the other end and take a look at the eligibility for matrimony. In the state of New York, any two persons who have arrived at legal age can be married by merely demonstrating that they don't have communicable syphilis. The time Dang, that's all you needed. You didn't need to be high value. You just need not to have, you know what I'm saying, the syphilis. Uh, hold on, I have to pause it from time to time because I'm writing. He's saying there's a great deal wrong with the values that people bring to divorce, what qualifies for marriage. So if you're going to these, if you go into a business, they're unprepared to do business or to be a partner, then more than likely that your business venture is going to fail. Uh, so let's continue. I think most people... Uh think less of the marriage contract than a contract to buy a television set. Oh. Yes, a great many of them tend to look to the sexual pleasures and uh, consider that that's all that marriage is for, just licensed fornication. Bomb. The thing, wait, wait, think less of marriage, hold on, and contract, right? And licensed fornication, how do you think about it? This is the thought process of the parents and grandparents that came before us. And these would be the great grandparents who's having this conversation that at this time in the sixties and before, this is the way people were approaching the thought process of marriage, 
right? But that's not what we're hearing uh, in the revisionist streets, YouTube streets. It was all perfect and, and pixie dust and roses, right? Um, licensed fornication, the thought of, hey, let me just do this thing so I can X, Y, and Z. And today it has gotten so bad that it's not even to that point anymore. It has gotten beyond. So each generation just pushes a little bit further. It's something that should last a lifetime. They figure, well, if we can't get along, we'll just go get a divorce. The San Francisco lawyer, Jake Ehrlich, once wrote that divorce and embalming are two processes that should never be resorted to prematurely. International Business Machines, IBM presents CBS Reports, The Divorce Dilemma. Now, here is CBS News correspondent, Walter Cronkite. Today, the United States has the highest divorce rate in the world, six times that of our northern neighbor, Canada, for example. What, what year was this? Walter Cronkite looking all young. Hold on. I'm going to rename this one the divorce dilemma, right? Six times that of Canada. We take marriage for granted, sort of a permanent honeymoon. The words that come to mind are happily ever after and until death, not divorce, do us part. In a way, our laws reflect this. Marriage is simple and cheap. Divorce is complicated and expensive. How you get divorced depends on where you live. Unlike many countries, we have no overall federal law relating to divorce. Each of the 50 states has its own set of rules, and the confusion that exists is shown by the different number of grounds in the various states. 14 grounds for divorce in these states, 13 grounds in these states, 12 grounds, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and one ground for divorce in this state, New York. What are these grounds? They range from adultery, which... Okay, let's pause. Um, LF says, I agree that there needs to be some qualification to get married, but I'm against the state getting involved in the determining who deserves to get married. Yeah, it becomes really tricky. It becomes really, really tricky. But it, I, yeah, I agree. So he, he, according to the news report at this time, there, there was an issue with the fact that different states had different grounds for being divorced, right? So he's naming them now. Counts for only 2% of all U.S. divorces through this melancholy catalog. Unchastity, impotence, desertion, non-support, mental That's cruelty. Thing, dude, you going fast, hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude, I'm taking notes, hold on, let's go. In a way, our laws force in these states. Ability, insanity, yeah, divorce depends on where you live. Unlike many countries, we have no overall federal law relating to divorce. Each of the 50 states has its own set of rules, and the confusion... ...ability, inability, uh, insanity. Uh, divorce depends on where you live. Through this melancholy uh, catalog. Unchastity, impotence... Okay, unchastity, impotence. Impotence, desertion... They say, oh, the woman, if you say the woman, uh, you know, did the, did the woman initiates more after the no fault, because this is the conversation we're, we're getting through. So before the no fault, you had to have grounds, right? So non-support. Non-support. Support, mental cruelty. Mental cruelty. That's, that's emotional and verbal abuse. Physical cruelty. Uh, domestic abuse. These are all the reasons that people were filing for divorce at this time. Drunkenness. Okay, drunkenness. That's what the woman said at the beginning of the clip. Fraud. Okay, that dude is mad sus. Or so is she. They over there doing the body incline. Bigamy. Bigamy. Before they was uh, seeking sister wives. You couldn't, you couldn't do the whole Mormon thing. Living apart. Living apart. Sorry, I have to keep clicking it. I want to make sure I get notes on apart. this. Drug, drug addiction. 
Oh, what in the world? All of this stuff existed in the perfect, the perfect place in the minds of the people. All of this stuff was going on back then. No. Prediction in incompatibility. None of this stuff couldn't have been happening. Mm -mm. Everybody was just over the moon. Incompatibility, insanity. Insanity, mentally unstable. Insanity. Hold on, let's see how many he named. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six and six is 12. He named 14 different things. I'll go back over that list, right? Adultery, unchastity, impotence, desertion, non-support, mental cruelty, physical cruelty, drunkenness, fraud, bigamy, living apart, drug addiction, incompatibility, and insanity. You know what I noticed when we actually begin to go into these spaces? It's not as exciting and titillating as... Um, arguing and fighting on the internet all day. But even if people come to these videos after they become exhausted and emotionally spent, um, prayerfully, we can add some light on the topic. So I'm going to just keep doing, doing it. Separation, what happened? You? When you listen to people whose marriages are in trouble, when you hear them pour out their hearts to court investigators in places like Detroit and Toledo, the things they talk about have little to do with law. Four children you were born are the sole issues of the marriage, is that right now? That's right. They are human and painful. What is your position, sir, on your wife's motion for this temporary relief and, of course, her filing for this divorce? Yeah, I don't want no divorce. <laughs> I don't want any divorce. Pause. So this is reflective of what the men are saying. The woman is the one who usually wants to divorce. 80% are filed by the man. I have to get that statistic, by the way. And um, it's the woman who usually wants. Well, if in this case, the woman is bringing the complaint, if in this case, the man is the perpetrator, right? Of course, he's not going to want the divorce. Of, <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. How do you quote a statistic without looking at the reality of why somebody would say, hey, put my hand up. I don't want to be abused in this case anymore. Right. To, to leave that off the table is crazy. But I said before, when somebody signs up for a music deal and they're all excited to get the music deal, it's usually the artist who wants out the deal. How many times do you see the record label come and say, no, 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 I want out the deal. They're the one who structured the deal. They're the one who's benefiting from the deal. So it's usually the artists like Prince, like, like uh, the, even DMX, like Michael Jackson, like TLC. It's usually the artist who realizes that they're getting the bad or the short end of the stick who wants out of the deal. And if you look at the marriage as the deal and the woman is coming and she's realizing she's getting the short end of the stick, you're going to see her coming forward more saying she wants out the deal. And the man is going to be like, no. So in this case, he's saying, no, he doesn't want to get divorced, right? Why have you filed this action for divorce? What are your reasons for filing? Because I just can't go on living with him. What are your reasons? Why can't you live with this man? I don't like him. I don't love him. They just... You live with him for you live with him for eleven years, and you've had four children by this man. That's right. What's happened to the feeling? Well, the feeling hasn't been there for quite a while, and I'm just tired of trying. I don't want to live with him. I don't want him under the same roof with me. How is it you lost this feeling, this interest in your husband? It just happened gradually over the years. I don't even now. I'm not even sure I loved him when I married him. Oh, dang. Did she say that in the way? Dang, lady, that is gay. She is out of control. <laughs> She's doing the most in divorce court. And the man, which is mostly males, were in this space, as you can see. He's trying to sympathize. Like, yo, why don't you want to be with him? She, then she surely didn't have to go to that degree. She was like, you know, come to think of it. I mean, what are y'all thoughts? Y'all put it in the comment section. I can see, but my goodness, lady. She seemed to be more happy uh, at work or working than she was while she was at home. Oops. I just did a video the other day. She said she would gladly work without, you know, what did that? I, I don't want to misquote, but something to the effect the brother said that some women love motherhood so much they would do it without pay. Now, here he is in this divorce proceeding saying she seemed, she seemed more happy at work. Than she was at home. Why? 
Mm-hmm. I'm writing, you guys. You know this is noteworthy. All right. I ask a question, and instead of getting a polite or a civil answer, I get a kind of a snotty answer, and I don't like it. The real issue is yeah. my wife is selfish. She's looking Ooh. out for herself. Wait, pause. Yo, this is so juicy. Jeez, I'm bred. So um, the uh, the lady is saying that she's getting a manosphere type of hard truth, right? She don't like the way he's speaking to her, right? Snotty, she called it. Uh, she doesn't like it. So she doesn't like the way she's being treated. And then he comes back. Nah, sis, you just selfish. So the female's response is she's not feeling it. And his response is that you're selfish. Ooh. Well, he began to stay out late and he started running around and, you know, it just really made me a nervous wreck. And I was trying to work and babysit too and I just couldn't do both of them. It's completely finished. I, no more. I've had it. What emerges in preliminary steps for divorce has to do with people, with relationships deep and complex. It is very difficult to assess the true situation, as any expert would tell you. Toledo Family Court Judge Paul Alexander. All they see are the surface manifestations. He came home drunk and beat me up. That's a very common uh, assertion. Why did he drink and why did he come home and beat her? Wait, no. You see how he tried? Hey, okay. uh, listen, old man with the glasses. Check it out now. Welcome to those who just joined us. So now he's trying to get to the to the why. Men and women deal with mental, emotional pressure differently, right? So he's trying to get to the what was making this man drink and what was making this man stay out the house? Was it a brawling woman, an angry woman, right? So the same reason, the same allowance he's given to explore, this is what I'm saying in today's space and time, instead of shutting down the whole conversation and we're trying to get understanding, then what led to this point? Why did this person become this way on both sides? They don't inquire into that. Detroit judge, Victor Baum. They've gathered their ideas largely from the mass media, ah. which romanticize and glamorize marriages. I think a good many Americans expect too much from marriage as a result. Hey, he said mass media. Let me write that down. Mass media. Who's running at this time mass media? Who's allowing these images to come through? Who's drawing Prince Charming? Who's writing these fairy tales? Who's selling this narrative, right? And they're looking for the perfect marriage. Hmm, interesting. And I think a good many are prepared to give too little. I have yet to see the case where one of the spouses is entirely at fault uh, and the other is angelic and entirely without fault. Usually both have contributed to the marital discord and the problem and the divorce. Monsignor John C. Knott, director of the National Catholic Welfare Conference Family Life Bureau. People don't know how to love each other, honestly. It's, uh, it's as simple and basic as that. They, they have no idea of how to love another person. They're completely wrapped up in themselves. We're all born self-centered, and I think part of our maturation process is to get out of ourselves and begin to think of another person, begin to feel for another person, and begin to love. They just can't accept love and they can't give it because it was never fed into them. It's not in the sexual adjustment, it's not in the money adjustment, it's not in the toothpaste adjustment or any of these adjustments, it's in the love adjustment. Uh-huh. Thank you, thank you, sweet tea, darling. Welcome to the discussion. Um, let me put it on the screen, let me see here. Yeah, so he's saying that it's not about, it's not about all the things you're saying it's about. It's a, a, a human issue, a soul issue. That's, now he's talking my language, right? When you look beyond all of the trappings, it's a soul issue and how it is that you learn to interface with humanity. How much of yourself are you willing to give up? And how much do you think and require others to give up, right? This is what he's saying. But sometimes it's going to go over our heads sometimes. But um, yeah, basically he's saying, and, and and if this was then, how much so more now when there's more materialism, more trappings, more things to get you cut, caught up and, and off course, right? Yeah, gonna make me have to come back to YouTube, bruh. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Jerome Nathanson, a leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture. Beautiful girl, handsome man. Come together, big deal. First thing you know, she doesn't look so good in the morning. <laughs> uh, the next thing you know, uh, he doesn't shave often enough. Uh, he shouts and he this and that. Uh, 
That's not the person I married. Boom. When the explosion of a marriage leads to divorce, the next stop may be Reno, Nevada, a place long associated with easy divorce. It's not uncommon to see women with children arriving at the Reno airport to be met by a lawyer who will handle the final steps of a divorce already settled by other lawyers at home, where divorce may not be so easy. Such matters as child custody and alimony have been worked out in advance. For the rich, alimony may be substantial and highly publicized. For the majority, there is often not enough money to go around. Did you hear that? So they were having issues with getting divorced in their state, and they, these people were flying. They get flewed out. They was getting flewed out to... <laughs> They was getting flewed out to go get divorces. Oh my goodness, yo. But people will have you to believe that it was all pixie dust and, and, and rosy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The woman may have to go back to work and there may be financial. Right, right, LF. It's, it's, that's what I was thinking too. I was thinking, isn't Las Vegas where you easily get married? So like LF said, it's the home of easy marriage and easy divorce. They hitting you both ways. Like, yo, you don't even like them at the end of the day. And you saw who showed up, the lawyers, they getting paid, coming and going. So very interesting. Hardship all around. Properly executed Nevada divorces have been accepted in all of the 50 states. Right. The meeting in the lawyer's office can be a poignant one, for exactly. even here a child may not escape the harsh legalistic mechanics of divorce. Have you been separated very yes, long? we have. Mm -hmm. Approximately how long? Just uh, three years. Um, do you uh, call as it? of June. June of uh, this year? Yes, it would years. be three years in June. Well, I think that would be advisable then, and uh, we'll use the ground of three years separation. Oh, uh, I love that. I love the Pardon? Chris, would you like to write on, draw some pictures on this while we're talking yeah. here? They're like, be quiet, Chris. Like, look how Chris' mother looking at him. Like, Chris, you better shut your mouth, Chris. You see, I'm trying to get something done. Why, <laughs> Why she knows she on crime? But y'all, please. <laughs> yo, she looked at Chris like, yo, slow down, Woody. I'm trying to do something here. Why don't you draw there. some pictures, honey? All right. Fine. I didn't know you had uh, three year. Separate. Well, this, this is one of the legal grounds in Nevada, one of the nine legal grounds, mm -hmm. and it, uh, it's very simple because the evidence required is only that you have lived separate and apart for three years continuously and without cohabitation in any way, shape, or mm -hmm. form. There is a fine point of irony in the fact that Reno, famous for divorces, also may lay claim to the title of marriage mill. Mm -hmm. No blood tests are required. There's no waiting period. Those getting divorced, however, must live in Nevada for six weeks and subscribe to the polite and sometimes unspoken fiction of intending to continue residence indefinitely. Nevada Governor Grant Sawyer points out to reporter Warren Wallace how important that one word indefinitely can be. Indefinitely is the key word, and of course the, uh, the uh, way out of this when people decide to move uh, whether it be almost immediately after the the divorce procedure or a day or two or a week or month is that they've changed their mind. That amounts to fraud, doesn't it? It, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, it depends on whether or not the person was telling the truth at the time they testified. Now, <laughs> you saw how that lawyer took a minute like, hmm, computing. He's like, that's fraud, ain't it? He's like, no, 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 really. And, and sometimes we make, you know, I want to stay on track. Right? I'm sitting here at this desk. It's my intention to stay in the office all day. But uh, I may not. I may change my mind. Something may come up and I may leave. Now, I, I know this is begging the question. But the uh -huh. fact of the matter is this is the legal uh, approach to the matter of domicile and indefinite uh, period uh, after the, the uh, divorce process is over. What do lawyers say about the effect of this on legal standards? Jason Burke of New York. In all of the sister states, and by and large, people who go and procure divorces there are engaging in perjury in that they are expressing an intention which is not a real intention. That is of actually residing permanently or at least indefinitely in that sister state. Professor Henry Foster of New York University Law School, considered by many to be the leading expert on divorce in this country. The migratory divorce situation in America is 
repugnant to me primarily because the court which is not at the home of the parties which is a foreign court does not have the facilities to treat with the problems of any children it's not concerned with them really hmm. a divorce mill is a very mechanical thing to ease the hard realities of mechanical divorce for migrant divorcees and their children there are places like the Donner Trail Ranch, just outside Reno. How many people realized, that I, when I saw this, shout out to Brother Hezekiah News for all of these awesome, 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 you know, in the crates he, he digs out and puts up on YouTube. Definitely go check this brother out. Um, how many people knew about this? How many people knew about the migratory, what is it? Divorce situation that they had going on. Or was everybody just doing their little house on the prairie, right? But when we bring these things up, somebody might say, but Amuna, they're not quote unquote black. But this is the, showing you the, the, the culture, what's going on, what it's looked like. When you look at celebrities, some celebrities, um, you'll see that they married and divorced easily. The woman said it was what she was seeing in media that, or maybe I'm going ahead of myself, that made her think that she could do it because you have your favorite divorce like Marilyn Monroe and they marry today and divorce tomorrow. And it looks so easy that the everyday people say, well, the marriage is nice, but if I don't like the person, like he says, I don't like the fact that you brush your teeth after you drink orange juice, right? Then they're not really committed in that way. So this is not just a, a black or white issue. This has become a human issue um, based on what people are willing to tolerate. Some things are legitimate and some things are not legitimate, but you know, let's continue. It takes money. If you want six weeks of easy living, plus a bit of sightseeing and a sampling of local entertainment, it would be well to have at least $2,000 to pay the tab. Legal fees and airplane tickets run about another thousand. Still, the living is agreeable. Plenty to do. Pleasant company. A cozy place to nurse one's wounds. There is the question as to whether it is altogether healthy to be surrounded by companions in marital crack-up whether the conversation might not tend to be depressing and morbid. You know, I Wait a minute, did, were they going to divorce camp, son? <laughs> they was at divorce camp, they got horseback riding. And here's another thing, if you look at melanated people versus Europeans, who had $3,000 to, to plus the court fees to, to, to throw away in the in to divorce camp? You know, and in some cases that, that old adage is cheaper to keep it comes in especially if it's the woman that she had to have some access to capital to be even to pursue to pursue divorce in this way. I think they do find help in, in talking to each other because people talk much more easily to each other here than I think they do in most places. You wouldn't usually sit down to somebody you just met and tell them what, you know, horrible things happened to you. But here people do that, which I think is, you know, good. But I think it also, you can carry it too far that some people tend to get into a terrible rut and they spend the entire six weeks doing nothing but talking about what horrible people their husbands are or how miserable they are. And if they do that, that's no good either. Have you thought a lot about the past? Constantly. Come to any new conclusions about yourself? Yes, I have. I've decided uh, after 24 years that um, certainly having been so very, very close to one single man, and feeling that I had been quite let down, that uh, I have learned through these weeks that there is a future. Well, now you're a man and there aren't many men here. Did that uh, bother you, being in a minority? Not at all. As a matter of fact, it was a very new experience and a pleasurable experience. LF says, I never thought of what the lawyer said in the legal aspect. Divorce is perjury if I swore to stay together. If people took those type of oaths more seriously, they wouldn't marry in the first place. I mean, you definitely would think twice about it um, and about the 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 way in which you go about it on both sides, the way in which you treat the person. Uh, like he was saying earlier, once you get into it, a lot of people I see are, are talking, you know. <laughs> he was, he was like, yeah, there's about a divorce. These ladies about to hit the market soon. You know what I'm saying? He's up in there playing the piano and getting it in. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Nothing to do but wait, chat, think, or perhaps try not to think. Yeah, I love it. I love it. 
Is it me or does something sound off key? Is either the piano is or the singer? I'm sorry. They enjoying themselves though at the country, the uh the country club. Kev, welcome to the conversation. They are enjoying themselves at this divorce getaway retreat country club. And the dude, he is just like on, he's like, yeah, new shorties. <laughs> what in the world? money, the waiting may be easy enough. But if you don't have money, it will be necessary to earn your way. Quite a few must go to work because they came for divorce without even knowing there is a waiting period. How did you manage to come here without realizing you had to live here? I mean, didn't anybody tell you you had to live for a certain period of time? Uh, I just, well, the movie stars gave me the idea, you know. I said, well, they always go to, you know, to get a divorce. And said, why can't I? So that's the reason I came over here. What, what sort of work do you do? I'm a sh See, the move, that's, the, what, that's the clip I was talking about. I was ahead of myself. But the movie stars gave her the idea, and now the movie stars gave her the idea to go get the divorce. So they were talking, they was passing the information around, and she didn't realize that she was going to have to camp out a little bit. Show girl. What's a show girl? <laughs> well, they work at the craft table <laughs> in uh, 21. Doing what? Dealing out, well, something about the cards that uh, you have to make 21. Mm. And uh, the craft table, all you do is shoot the dice. This woman works in a hospital, night shift. How do you spend your time here? Well, so far, we just work and babysit in shifts. And uh, on the any, only time we have together, we take the children to the park or something during the day. Our night hours are all filled up from 4 o'clock until 10.30 in the morning. The hard realities of divorce are particularly hard for women with children who have to work to pay their way. It is difficult for the woman, and it is difficult for the child. More about this in a moment. When serious... Wait a minute, did Mom Deuce just get in the car and drive off? That was a weird scene. Whoever set that up, what in the world? That was weird. Trouble develops in a marriage. It seems the children are bound to suffer, no matter what steps are taken. In material terms, we spent $1,700,000,000 last year in the United States for aid to dependent children. Most of these children were products of broken homes. And in human terms, the cost of marital breakup is even more staggering. But senior not. We have, for example, about 10 to 12 million children now living in one-parent families and being brought up many times in neurotic circumstances. They don't have the right physical environment the right emotional environment, and these are where our dropouts are coming from. These are where our illegitimacies are, are coming from. And this is where our mental health problems in 10 years are coming from. And 500,000 children are being added each year to this whole tremendous uh, other world of childhood. For the sake of the children, should marriages be held together at any cost? The answer is not a simple one. Some say that the price may be too high greater damage to the family and particularly to the children themselves. Morris and that's correct. Greatness for those who just joined us. It's a difficult situation because if the parents stay together um, while the children, just for the sake of the children and they are not able to um, grow their emotional intelligence and deal with one another in a respectful way, um, that also is damaging. So there's some people of the thought process that, oh, you grew up in a single parent household, you're going to be messed up. But there's a lot of people who grew up in two parent households and it's just as messed up, right? So I think the, the, the fact that you're messed up has many factors and it's not just that one parent was there and one parent was out the home. Is he talking about all children or just white children? That's what we're gonna we're gonna go have to go into. Right now, we're just getting a baseline, Kev, because again, like I said, I'm speaking to a lot of the conversation about what was happening. Um, right, all children is affected by divorce, and as we could see, like LF said, the the divorce camp is lit. It's almost three three thousand, four thousand dollars just to go out there and get it. So the chances of the melanated woman at this time, even if she was in a situation that would warrant her desiring to get a divorce, the chances are she couldn't afford it, right? So 
the fact that people stayed in situations is not indicative as well as to whether or not the situation was healthy. It was just whether or not they could uh, economically afford to leave the situation. And because there was oppression on top of oppression, if you would say, in that time, then the melanated family through this um, needing to stay alive and survive had to stick together. And that's what a lot of people not realizing that the, the social pressures also helped the bond to stick together. And once some of that, those issues were alleviated, <clears throat> people began to fall apart, right? But we're getting some of this history so that we don't have to make it up as we go, right? Bosco, a former judge, describes the harm an unhappy marriage can do to children. I have seen cases, and any divorce lawyer has seen cases, where a considerable damage has been done to children uh, by virtue of the fact that the parties have stayed married or fought over the years while the children were growing up. I think that uh, children can adjust themselves to a frank break where the parties are not getting along temperamentally than uh, in situations where uh, they attempt to cover up the differences, but the children right. are fully aware of what's been, what's, what's been going on. Right. A leading expert in this field, child psychiatrist and author of the book, Children of Divorce, Dr. J. Louise Despair. For many years preceding the legal... So in these old-time uh, shows, for me, you just write it down. That's a book to look up if you want to get more information past that 180% statistic. I'm sorry. You write down the name of the person they just said, children of divorce, see if it's still in print, go on Amazon, eBay, wherever, pull the stats from that time period so that you can add more factual information to the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I could tell there's a peppy. <laughs> There may have been such tension, such hostility, rampant, exploding, that the child cannot help but be permeated with it and threatened by it. And the child may react in a way which is almost a thank you because at least the battles are over for him. Dr. Desper speaks of another divorce problem, the mother with custody of the children, the father's rights to visit the children. When the the child is repeatedly prevented from seeing his uh, father for one reason or another. The child, even if he's very young, sees through the motivation. He understands, it's very transparent to him that every time he's supposed to go at three o'clock with his uh, father, something happens that he has no control over, of course. Maybe he's not feeling well or he has a dancing lesson or whatnot. And he will not put it this way that my mother is hostile to my father. He doesn't put that way that he senses that the mother is instrumental in preventing seeing the father. There are also silences which are very eloquent. Uh, whenever the father is mentioned or the child comes back from seeing the, the father and is bubbling over something that has happened, a hostile expression and a silence are telling volumes to this child. Wait a minute. So that's also happening in the European community in the 1960s? You have some people who believe that and I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that this human behavior of trying to control the situation once it's gone wrong and using the child as a pawn in this way, which I don't agree with, was happening in other communities. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being a bit facetious, but I'm saying all that to say, you know, broaden the scope. So this psychologist is saying that these women were doing this to the fathers and this was one of the issues that arise. It's not a good thing. But this is what was happening. And this was what happening at that time as well. Family court referee, Nellie Mack. Sometimes they can really be vicious about it. And you say, do you love your child? Well, of course I love my child. I wouldn't do a thing in the world to harm the child. But you can't get them to see where this hatred in themselves that they're transferring to the child mm -hmm. is hurting the child. Many times you can, but, but sometimes not. Sometimes not. To protect the children, the family court in Milwaukee has introduced a revolutionary procedure. Circuit Judge Robert Hansen has added a new dimension which greatly enlarges the power of the court in family matters. It was upheld by a state Supreme Court decision which ruled that a child in a divorce action should be treated as an interested and affected person, not as a pawn, possession, or chattel. In divorce proceedings in Milwaukee, there are the usual lawyers representing the father and the mother. But, and here is the new dimension, there's also a court-appointed lawyer representing the children. He is not merely an advisor, his status is equal to that of the other two attorneys, 
as arguments carry as much weight as theirs. And this is interesting. You have those who are interested in the male, the female, and then they're saying at that time they had those who were speaking on behalf of the child, what is in the best interest of the child, right? Um, Kev says, facts, I'm just so used to seeing all the negative narratives and or effects be aimed at black folks. The doc is an eye opener to me. And and thank you for thank you for joining us because this is the kind of stuff you know we do over here is is look into stuff that oftentimes is off the table or people don't look at not for the purposes of pointing the finger but for the purposes of getting a a, a holistic view and a, a different uh, understanding of what we're seeing and what we're talking about. I do not believe that the father is worthy to be called a parent, considering all of the factors previous to the divorce the factors that they've tried to bring out and the, subsequently since I've reinvestigated it's my feeling that he's not worthy to be called a parent and that he's unfit to have custody. Once the children are given a voice in court their interests come into the foreground and are often the main point discussed. Judge Hanson describes the reaction parents have to the court stepping in in this way. Our experience has been that the common sense of providing for representation of the children so recommends itself to the parents that they don't resist and they're almost relieved by the idea that there will be somebody in these proceedings to speak up for the children. And I think they see the common sense that the children are not to be a pawn in a contest or a prize awarded to the winner. The important feature of this new court procedure in Milwaukee is the great additional power it gives to the bench. As we see in the courtroom of Judge Hanson's associate, Judge Leander Foley, Jr., all the activities of the court's family conciliation department, psychiatrists, social workers, investigators, are brought into play to protect the child. Custody may even be taken from both parents, should such a step seem warranted. Have you had an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, this case with the minor children of the parties? Yes, I have. And could you indicate to the court uh, what the results of your interviews with these children are? Well, I find the children to be, um, considering the circumstances, I think the younger three in particular have done fairly well. The older two children have shown some signs of problems. The oldest child in particular has had some difficulty with the law. The second oldest child is, a, uh, in essence, a school dropout in that he's attending the vocational school one day a week and is working the rest of the time. I think that the young, the oldest girl has almost assumed a quasi-mother position in this family, which is almost too much to expect of a 13-year-old child. At present, I think she's doing a fairly good job. But when we see these children reaching the dating age, then we see the problems usually cropping up. Our recommendation would be that physical custody be vested in the father, legal custody with the Department of Public Welfare. Mrs. Oops. Shelley, may I ask you, has he been a good provider as far as the children are concerned? He's been, yes, this is one point in which both the children and the mother, as well as the father, agree. The children have always stated that no matter what they wanted, their father always provided for them. The mother also agreed, and even in her highest points of uh, conflict and turmoil with this man, has always stated that he has provided very well for them. All right. You've heard the recommendation of Mrs. Shelley and the guardian ad litem for your children. Are you willing to say, accept and take over in the physical custody of these children now? Well, whatever the court, courts decide, but I, I can handle my children. I mean, I can provide very well. I will not let them down. Now listen, when we give the legal custody of these children to the Department of Public Welfare, we do that to help you to assist you in the supervision of these children, the control of these children to really supervise the Sorry, I didn't know. I'm not going to go all the way through the whole documentary. You could definitely, I'll put the link in the box, but um, what happened to the mother? They're going to put the child in custody of welfare. That, that's kind of, but again, it's, it's illustrating to us that this is not um, just one side or the other. These are issues that human beings, especially Americans exposed to certain things with certain expectations was experiencing at this time. Let me let me go finish this part. that's going on between your wife and yourself concerning these children and this does not eliminate or destroy both your wife and your responsibility to emotionally support these children now that means that both of you must cooperate with one another in the duty and the right to love these children when i talk about love i'm not talking about giving them things i'm talking about training them and motivating them and educating them and disciplining these children 
Pause. Uh, he just spit facts right there. When he's talking about love, he's just not talking about possessions. Emotional support, education, discipline, right? There's many people today who think loving your children is just giving them things. They have the latest iPad and the latest shoes and the latest this. And the children emotionally, they, are, they have a deficit. There is a void, even if you're present. Right. Even if you are present, like you saw that in the recent Corona uh, conversation last year, when people had to stay home with their children, they were hollering, hollering Like you actually have to see them. You actually have to interface with them. You actually have to invest energy into them. A lot of people have children and, and also mates that they don't want to do these things to, but they want the benefits of taking pictures and putting them on social media. Like, oh, look at my children. Oh, look at my mate. You know, and the whole time your, your back is to them. You're not paying them no type of attention. And this was in a time where they didn't have social media. So all it did, all the technology did for me is exasperate situations and problems that was already there. It was the latent within humanity. First, the TV, first it was the radio that came in, but the family gathered around that. Then it was the TV that came in and it was still kind of gathered around. And the more and more individualized these technology became is the more and more closed off people became from other people. Right. And so we go outside looking for the easy energy. And um, when we have to deal with those who are in our physical space, it becomes another story. You mustn't in, you must cooperate with one another in following the directions of the Department of Public Welfare. But you must also cooperate by presenting each other to the children with an attitude of respect. That you respect each other as the mother or the father of these children. You mustn't in any way um, prohibit the children from loving their mother. They want their mother to be somebody that they can emulate, they can follow. And if you start destroying her in any way, even though she is doing things that are wrong, you're going to hurt them emotionally. And the court is the necessary pleading with you to cooperate with the Department of Public Welfare, the Department of Domestic Conciliation, and <clears throat> your wife. Your Honor, when I spoke to Mr. Barron in his office. Dang, he just, oh man. He, I mean, they were spinning facts in a, a little bit. They were spinning, listen, he's talking about respect that in today's space and time, even on the social media, I'm going to go over some videos and I'm, I'm going to tell y'all to excuse the language from now, because even just listening to some of this stuff, I'm like, what? That respect doesn't, at least it pretended to exist before people would marry back in this time. But in today's space and time, it doesn't even exist in the way people think about one another, the way the male thinks about the female, the way the female thinks about the male. In a lot of these cases, let me just say, in the vocal spaces and the people who are on their platforms spewing toxicity, I'm just like, wow, you're going into this with a lack of respect. How much so when a child resorts, oftentimes you're not going into it to even marry. And then when a child comes as a result of your interactions, this, this toxicity that he's talking about and advising this man not to do, um, it, it is making it worse. It is making it absolutely worse where you're like, what would happen if you had to deal with a child and that child has to hear you speaking ill of their mother or speaking ill of their father? That's one thing that is it's low toll. It's no good. It's a bad look to poison the minds um, of children against the uh, their other uh, parents. Right. That shows that people need to grow up. <laughs> LF says that's a real statement. The individualized media has isolated people. Yeah. You'll be in the same room. You have your phone. The other person has their phone. They turn their backs. You know, they have their little tablet. I don't want to see you. I don't have any time for you. And, and that was existing before. You may see it as going out with the friends, playing some pool. Um, you may see it as a uh, poker night. You may see that go having a drink at the bar, but now you can escape because it's all escapism, right? Now you can escape in your phone, on your website, on the chat, on, on YouTube, wherever it is that you escape from instead of dealing with your issues. So it's, it, it becomes this dependency that you have on other people to make you feel however you need them to make you feel, but that's crazy. I'm gonna wrap it up now though. I'm not gonna go the whole way. Like I said, I'm gonna put the link in the box. If you're enjoying this, thumbs up the video. 
share the video, like the video, and definitely click the notification. Because now that I have these capabilities, I'll be doing a bit more of these videos. I've learned a lot of things or I didn't know things. I want the children to love her more. Well, first of all, I think if this man understands what this proceeding is, and he certainly has shown to the court in this interview a, um, a, a sincere interest in these children. I'm sure he's going to do a good job. The court will find, however, that uh, in view of the conflict, that both the parents are not able to give adequate support to these children and therefore transfer the legal custody to the Department of Public Welfare temporarily grant the physical custody to the father. We'll adjourn this matter for a few minutes and allow the lawyers to get together and we'll go into the matter of the what we're going to do on the uh, question of the granting of the, or the trial of the issue on the distribution of the estate. Yeah, Walter, hold on, Walter. I got one thing to say and then I'm gonna wrap it up. You know, this conversation, this lack of respect, this my way or the highway, this, this manosphere, this, um, highly feministic, all of these, everybody's drawing their line in the sand. That doesn't work in relationships. That doesn't really work to build healthy, productive, um, fruitful relationships. It doesn't. This is oftentimes people who speak like this either don't have relationships or have very terrible relationships. Um, and they want other people to get more of the same, right? I, I heard somebody the other day on a live and the people were like, well, um, have you ever taken care of a woman? And the guy was like, why you wouldn't know my personal business? And they're like, well, wait a minute, cause you over here talking a lot and we trying to figure out where is this coming from? We trying to figure out whether the fox has a tail. That's my little go-to whether the fox has a tail, right? And people sometimes get offended. Like, why are we going down this road? It's because you're selling me something and I'm trying to figure out if you're taking it. I'm trying to figure out how, how did it work for you? This is what testimonials are. Are you giving me ideology? Are you giving me philosophy? Are you giving me reality? I need to know what category to put your information and your advice. And when you come to um, thinking that it, you because you were born a male that you can just subjugate everybody around you and it's going to be well with your soul. <sighs> You know what I mean? And if you're a female, then think, you know, just because you give birth and you have the womb that people should bow down because you're a God, that also, all of these thoughts are errant thinking. You know what I mean? In, in my experience, all of these thoughts are errant thinking. People are souls to respect one another is what we need to do um, and, and to work together basically to make it work. And if we don't do these things, we're going to continue to end up with and we listen to the, the raunchy neighbor or you listen to the miserable old man or you listen to the, the uh, whoever it is, the lady with the curlers up the street. If you listen to all of these people, you're probably going to get what they got. And if you can look into their lives and you don't like what they got, um, then you might not want to take their advice. Right. So with that said, like I said, thank you for tuning in. If you're interested in the documentary, you can go ahead and watch the West. Let us know what else you find in it. Um, and we'll come back again and talk more about this conversation around divorce, around feminism, around relationships, around modern men and modern women. And what's the real root cause of all of these issues? Thank everybody for tuning in. This is Amuna. Everybody have a blessed day.